Hi, and welcome to another episode of Startup Stories, where I interview the best and brightest startup founders and experts so you can be ahead of the curve with your own startup venture. This episode brings us together with Ross Burdorf from Zen Business, a startup that makes it simple, easy, and accessible for everyone to start and run a small business. Ross, who is known for his ability in building teams and executing in a healthy company culture, is the former CTO of HomeAway, a home rental competitor to Airbnb that sold to Expedia for $3.9 billion in 2016. It was exciting to have Ross on the show and get an insight into how a more seasoned entrepreneur is approaching the challenges one faces as a startup. We also talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the building of a company culture, as well as one of the challenges Zen Business had to face early on. I'm super excited to share this conversation with all of you today. Enjoy. All right. Thanks so much for joining, Ross. Um, it's you just told me it's six a.m. and and uh, <laughs> it's one it's one p.m. here. So so thanks for for getting up for this. Um, I just wanted to um, or for our listeners to know a little bit who you are and what startup you're working on right now. Maybe you can do a short intro with a short pitch about uh, your startup. You bet, Daniel. I'm I'm happy to be here and and uh, uh, honored to be on your podcast. So, just give you a quick quick background on me. I'm 30 plus years uh, startup entrepreneur. Um, some of my big hits, I guess, is are Excite.com, Hal Computer Systems uh, was bought by Fujitsu, the last computer company from the ground up. Uh, most recently, founding CTO at HomeAway, raised $453 million, took an IPO, and then uh, two years ago, sold it to Expedia for $3.9 billion. And then my latest gig that I, that I think we're going to talk about today is a, a company I'm super excited about, which is uh, ZenBusiness.com. And, and what Zen Business does is it um, helps companies like like uh, we're talking about, get started up. We we act as their back office, or you know, at the highest level, think of us as, uh, you know, if uh, you know you spin up AWS for Amazon, you know, you want to think about Zen Business as the ability to spin up a uh, you you know your new company in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So we provide everything: formation, banking, accounting, insurance, domain name, the 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 whole. The whole ball of wax. Yeah, that is so cool because I'm I'm facing that right now, or yeah, the next few months um, wow. here in Switzerland. So I'm gonna do everything, you know, uh, old old school. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we could really use something uh, like Zen Business here. So really cool um, topic. Um, how did you? How did you identify that that problem um, that you're trying to solve with with Zen Business? How did you test that you know there's really a market for that and and a big need for for what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I have a bit of a philosophy around you know uh, startup ideas. I mean, I think I think the and actually the ideas are easy at, at, at some level. There, the ideas are easier. <laughs> you know, the good ideas are hard. And I think the, the, the also have a belief that good ideas are forged, you know, like you forge, you know, uh, a tool in, in a furnace in that you know, rarely do you come up with some great idea. It, it happens over years, uh, certainly months and, and Zen business was, was no exception. What's important, I think, for an idea is that you sh you are in the right. What I call it is in the right neighborhood. You know, e even if you go back to HomeAway, the, the, when we acquired all those companies, many of those companies throughout the globe were some of them were 15 years old. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's not like they, you know, someone had this brilliant idea. Let's do vacation rentals. Uh, yeah. You know, with the the brilliant idea with HomeAway was that we aggregated them all, and you know our innovation was to make the biggest uh, marketplace in the world. 
with uh, Zen Business, it started out, uh, you know, we were looking to do a, a growth equity roll up, which was the, the concept is to roll up a bunch of these businesses that were in entity formation. Mm-hmm. And w- what we discovered, i.e. part of the, the forging process or part of the vetting process, what we discovered is, is like, wow, there's a huge hole in the market uh, for small businesses in uh, getting formed and getting support uh, for their business. And, and, and so it, it's not like I woke up one day and said, geez, I'm going <clears> to <throat> uh, start Zen Business and we're going to help small businesses. I discovered this by, by being uh, investigating an area that had high margins, that, that seemed like there was uh, you know, a problem and uh, it seemed there was a lot of businesses adjacent to it. And, mm-hmm. you know, what I discovered is that, wow, there's this, this huge need that's being unmet. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, kind of the, the, the counsel I'd give for your listeners is you want to be in the right neighborhood. So you want, you want to be in a, in a neighborhood uh, you know, or an area in the, you know, in the business market uh, or, or in the consumer market or whatever market you're going after that, that is, you know, has lots of opportunity. I, I, I yeah. see, so, I see so many startups where, you know, the market's too small or it's too hard to enter the market, um, you know, independent of the idea. You, you, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, you know, fundamentally, it's like, is there money? Is there opportunity? Is, you know, is, is this a, a uh, you know, fruitful neighborhood? Yeah. And, and yeah. then, you know, you, you, you can dive in and, you know, investigate, uh, you know, the, the potential opportunities within that, within that, that neighborhood. Yeah, I mean the, the the first thing you say, I totally totally agree. Be- people come up to me and say, "I have this this idea," and what what I tell them is, you know, your idea is going to change. It's not going to be the one you had this morning. Uh, it's going to evolve, and you're going to see new problems. And you know, as as you did, you you found a problem by through working uh, on on a specific topic, and and the the neighborhood thing. I think it's, it's, I mean, totally, totally agreed. The thing is, as a beginner, it can, or for me, at least it was kind of difficult to know, you know, what, what does that mean to be in the right neighborhood? What is, what is a big market? Um, what are, you know, high, uh, high margins? Yeah. But uh, definitely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's not, I mean, I don't worry about, I shouldn't, I, I don't worry about the margins early on. I mean, but I do mer- worry about them pretty quick. You, you know, what's most important is, you know, I mean, I'll use me for example. So, uh, you know, one of my startups that I was involved in was in the the, the Detroit automotive supplier industry when, um, you know, uh, the automotive industry in the U S was contracting. Mm-hmm. So, so I don't care, you know, what our idea was, it was a really bad idea to start a business <laughs> in the automotive industry in the supplier, uh, side of the automotive industry and the company failed and it's no big surprise. It's just, it was impossible to sell into that market even even when our idea was going to save you money and time and you know oh this is the perfect mm-hmm. time there's just it was just a uh you know you couldn't sell anything so so it, it, it's more about <clears throat> you know are you in a you know are you in a, a bad market or um you know is there I, I think that's really the starting point for, yeah. for me is to make sure you're in a, in a, 
good neighborhood. You don't have to spend a bunch of time on this, but you know, starting up a automotive, uh, you know, supply company it, when when it was con- constricting was a bad idea. Now, of course, yeah. of course, you you know, you come back and say, well, Elon Musk started up electric cars, but he started up electric cars <laughs> because there's a clearly a demand for you know electric cars when he started up and has been been successful you know now of course all of the companies that he's disrupting uh now they're coming out with electric cars and um you know he's going to have some fierce competition here yeah, so definitely. it has to go with timing and and demand and uh you know so i think it's i think it's important for entrepreneurs to kind of start there fundamentally is is uh this a place where i can make money definitely yeah and so so you 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 were kind of, you were in this neighborhood and yep. you kind of got into it how did you what did you do to identify you know your your perfect customer or your your early adopters yeah um, and how did you acquire those yeah i think you know in um uh You know, you always want to get as much data, as much information as you can. In in, in our case, you know, there was uh, uh, we had access to public data about the activity in this industry. So, you know, when you form a company in the U.S., I'm sure it's the the case in Switzerland. Also, it's mm-hmm. public record when the entity gets created, who owns it, what's the ownership structure, et cetera. So it's a, it's a good news, bad news story in the, in the U S it's, it's, it's uh, done at the state level. So there's 50 mm-hmm. different uh, state databases that we had to access. And, and when we access those, we, we gathered a lot of information about the activity in this industry. And, you know, that led us to, uh, the competition and the players and who does what and the longevity of the customer. So we just, we just gathered a bunch of information from that perspective, not exhaustive, but enough that we started getting a a picture of the customers and, you know, and gathered industry information wherever we could on the web, we'd look at the competition and, and and got a, a a sense of what they were doing but it was but it you know mostly we wanted this to be uh founded on data and then mm-hmm. at that point we uh started running you know for gosh almost nine months we ran uh tests so we created websites uh dozens of websites And, um, I would say really low quality, uh, websites, but the, and highly, or, or another way to put it is highly experimental websites where we were looking to find the, the market and see where the customers were. So it's not, you know, I, I think when you talk about targeting the customers, certainly, We were, you know, had had were we we knew that we could get to our customers through paid search or through yeah. uh, digital marketing. So, you know, the the uh, we we knew this from the competition that they were accessing their customers and that this was a rich digital marketing funnel. So we wanted to make sure does our message resonate with customers and and when we say our message, we wanted to see which test message yeah. uh, uh, and which marketing approach resonated with our customers. And so we ran tests for nine months. And I mean, you know, I, we look back, on, <laughs> we look back on some of those tests, Daniel, and we're like, what in the heck were we thinking? <laughs> you know? and, yeah. and we look back at our churn data And I'm, I mean, I, just to give you, I remember, uh, you know, early on we had this idea that we were just going to do uh, some really expensive 
you know, uh, monthly plan, but we would do absolutely, it was like a concierge service plan. We sold a bunch of those uh, early on, but not enough to make a business. And uh, we ended up just refunding everybody's money uh, <laughs> at the end of the day. So if you look at our, you know, our churn data, it looks like, you know, the bottom fell out of our business, yeah. but it, it was just a few customers. So the, the, the point I'm making is that, you know, you really, you really want to listen to your customers. You really want to test this thing. I think the, the worst thing a, um, uh, entrepreneur can do is, you know, I've got this great idea. Let me spend, you know, 12 to 18 months building it and then show it to the world. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, that's the worst. That's the worst. So I think it's the inverse. It's like spend 12 to 18 days building it <laughs> and show it to yeah. the world and, yeah. and see what happens. Or, or I'll also use with the team, I'll say, uh, hey, listen, folks, no one knows about us anyhow. What are you worried about, you know, embarrassing yourself or, or us? We don't have any customers early on. The, the huge advantage we have is our ability to test and, exactly. you know, and uh, experiment on customers. I, you know, I said, when we get when we get as as big as home away, then we'll worry about you know, offending our, and, yeah. our, yeah, offending our customers and our brand. And you know, I think it's certainly important. We're, we're at that point right now. It's then business where, you know, we pay a lot of attention to our net promoter score and our reviews and really have high quality support at this point, because it's important to have a good reputation, which, which we do. Yeah, definitely. You, you mentioned um, a first version of the pricing um, that you tried in the beginning, how did you get to the pricing that that you have now? Because pricing is so important, um, but it's also kind of an I don't know an art or it's it's not super easy to price a, a product necessarily. So how how did you do it? Well, I think um, the, the the let me pull back from that question and I'll and I'll answer it in in general, and then I'll get very specific. So I think that the, the, um, the way I view running a business or being an engineer, or being a business uh, person, you, you know, there's a, a process that I like to adopt. And, and it is that there's plenty of uh, smart people that have went before you so we mm -hmm. we always try to be uh crafts people uh you know so we like to be craftsmen both men and women and so there's there's we go out and do the research okay what's out on the web about pricing you know what 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 are we you know, what, what's some of the best uh, thinking around pricing? So we go out and do that level of, of, of research. And there is a bunch of great stuff specifically around pricing. So I don't, you know, I, I would argue it's not uh, necessarily art. There's some very uh, great, um, which is non-obvious uh, thinking around pricing. So you can go out and do the research. We did that. And that really got us in the right headspace. And then what, what we like to do with everything is, okay, let's test it. Let's see what our customers think about our pricing. How does it affect uh, revenue? How does it affect conversion? Uh, you know, uh, all of the different aspects of the business. So backing up, go out, gather the best thinking about a problem because you're pretty sure that someone has done it before you. And man, if, if someone hasn't, then you're really on to something, right? If you're, the first, <laughs> yeah, if you're the first one to think about it and then, and then test it. So, you know, we have a, uh, you know, you, you know, testing is important. I think it's also important to make your best guess. You don't need to test 
everything. Some things are obvious and you can go with them. And then of course they get tested just by being put out there. But, but uh, then we tested it and, you know, um, we, we tested the elasticity of the pricing, you know, Hey, at this price, we drop conversion drops, but revenue goes up. Okay. Let's go with that. You know, at this price, conversion drops and revenue drops. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. price, you know. So so I think <clears throat> uh, at least with, you know, when, when you're talking about digital businesses, you have to test um, everything and, and, and keep, keep testing. Yeah. Yeah, the... the- I can see myself doing what you what you mentioned, uh, going out and and doing the research. Um, I, I I did that about pricing because I'm working on a startup as well, uh-huh. and there's so much out there. I mean, I do it for every question I have. I Google it, uh-huh. and there is really a lot out there. Um, so, and I mean, with software, I don't know. Is it it's probably easier to test? Well, I don't know than with a, a, a delivery service, for example. Um, but you could probably also, you could test the price in, in any environment, except yeah. maybe hardware. Yeah, you know, I will, um, <clears throat> I'll um, address that one directly. There is, is always an objection to, um, oh, it's too hard to test that. Oh, there's too too long of a, you know, lead Oh, you know, there's always an objection to testing. And I always, I, I, I always call or I attempt to call, you know, uh, BS on that because Mm. I think there's, you know, if you're in this mindset of, especially early on, uh, I need to test with my customer. I don't have that many customers. The only advantage I have over, the, you know, the behemoths I'm trying to disrupt is my ability to test and not worry about, you know, offending my early customers. So I I always think there's some way to test, Mm. Uh, you know, even with the delivery service, it's like, I mean, you know, so sit, sit your, your team down and, and go, wait a second, there must be a way to test this. How can we test this? You know, so maybe with the delivery service, you deliver it, and then you talk to the customer and you interview the customer. Hey, where you know how much would you want to pay for this? Or you know, have your delivery people charge variable, you know, mm. uh, pricing. You know, when they're delivering it, you you you, yeah. you know what I mean? It just yeah. there's always some scrappy way, and it doesn't have to be a perfect customer experience. What has to be is, you, you know, you have to get, especially early on, you have to get course fidelity directional feedback, yeah. right? Because the, the worst thing you can do is build something that no one wants, which is, mm. which, which is typical, right? Is, yeah. to, is to build stuff, you know, and, and worse than that, you've spent a bunch of time and energy and you find out that, no one cares. Yeah, no, that's the that's definitely the worst. I mean, we it, for the for the delivery service example. I mean, we're definitely uh, testing uh, one experiment. For example, is uh, we let the we let the our first customers pay as much as they want for the delivery. Perfect. We do a pay pay what you want experiment, and we're going to do that for the first X orders. Uh-huh. And already we we're seeing like a a trend where you know the what the perceived value of that delivery is to, to the customer which is super helpful um already for us right and then and then i'd push it you know because you you can do research on then i would push it uh more than what they're willing to pay right because <laughs> they're really willing to pay more you know but if yeah. you're but if you're asking <laughs> you know here's Definitely. what if, if you're asking but it's a good benchmark and And, you know, that's so much, I mean, it's just, it's just heads and head and shoulders above any other data you have because you're really talking to the customer. You know, that's the other thing. 
you know, in addition to running these tests, uh, we are constantly on the phone with our customers. Yeah. So, you know, and that just opens up uh, so much uh, information and so much uh, direction, you know, because what we inevitably find is, you know, our customers end up saying the same thing over and yeah. over. And then you can find problems and opportunities. But but you have to talk to your customers, which seems to be hard for many of these startups that they're they're not used to doing that. Yeah, it seems like nobody heard of customer development. Right. It's, right. It's it, it's amazing. Um, and we we made a bunch of mistakes with earlier uh, ideas and projects and. For this one, we just started with interviews and talking to like a hundred people, and now we have uh, like 50, 50 early adopters that that you know we have on WhatsApp and Facebook, and we just text them and they they give us a reply. We call them, so as you, it's so useful to to have that contact. Yeah. Um, so I, I just uh, somewhere online, I, th I think you mentioned it in an other podcast um you launched a a mobile app in the beginning mm -hmm. um that didn't i don't know if i got this right didn't didn't work out like you wanted it to yeah it's a complete disaster so it's actually the antithesis of what uh what we're talking about so um i don't know what to i mean let me see so it was a complete disaster i think we had some early signals that this would be uh, uh, valuable to customers. I think we also fell into the trap of, uh, wow, we, you know, we're a bunch of computer scientists and, you know, software developers, and this is really cool technology, and we have access to all of this privileged data. And uh, what if we built an app that would would uh, do this functionality and we'll use it to lead gen into our other products and services? And what we found out is nobody cared. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and, and so I will tell you that it's hard -er to, you know, to in this case, we invested a bunch of money, which is wasted money, uh, on building the app that no one cared about. So you know, with with I think when you you know when you're building apps, you have to be. Um, I mean, I I the, no excuses. I think we could have done a better job at um, you know testing out. There was a the, in hindsight, we could have tested this out on a, on a web page. You know, yeah. and see, seeing if anyone wanted to do this. But, you know, um, in our exuberance, uh, you know, we um, wasted time and money. And I think it was a good lesson for us early on. It's like, we're never going to do that again. You know, yeah. we're, we're not smarter than our customers in the market. Let's, um, uh, you know, and it, and that was the point at which okay, stop. We're testing everything moving forward. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, did, everyone falls into that trap once yeah, or you, at least once. Yeah, <laughs> even you know, even uh, you know, someone that should know better. But of course, if it would have worked, then we all would have been brilliant, and we'd have said, "Oh, of course, we're brilliant." And, but, but you know, it just never works that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I asked you a question before the interview: if there was any other topic you you'd like to to talk about, and you mentioned culture, and c culture to me is, I mean, it's it's really really important, um, but it's really difficult to to create a healthy company culture. How do you uh, tackle that? Um, well, 
I mean, I think um, it is a, it's an important part of any company. I think it, you know, evolves over time and it is a, you know, unlike testing, we were just talking about testing culture is something that, you know, you have to have a long term commitment to. And I think it it starts at the, uh, you know, at the executive team. So I think. You know, everyone is watching what the executives or the leaders are doing in the company. So you need to have a culture at that level that, you know, you you want to cross the company. So everyone's watching you. And in our company, uh, you know, the culture, I'm known for this at, at all of my companies, uh, you know, of building a, a culture of, of, you know, it's kind of the, I call it the good news, bad news culture. It's the, the good news is we treat everybody like adults. And the bad news is we treat everybody like adults. So, (laughs) so, you know, we're not going to be watching the clock with you and we're not going to be, uh, uh, you know, treating you like, uh, children and, the, you know, we expect results out of you and, and, you know, we expect ownership and follow through and, you know, uh, commitment. And, and, and so, you know, this is really what I call, you know, a, an adult uh, culture. And I think my experience is that it, 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 like any culture, it, uh, you know, has a virtuous cycle. So it builds upon each other or Mm -hmm. on it. So those kind of people stay at the company, the, those, the people that are, that, that aren't like that get weeded out and leave. Um, because all the other adults in the company are demanding that, uh, you know, that they, uh, produce and commit and, you know, that they, they, follow through with this culture. Um, and I also, you know, recently saw something on, um, uh, uh, public television. I'm on the board of our local public television down here in Austin, Texas, which is KLRU. It's a, it's a famous public television that does Austin city limits. And w- there was recently a, a thing on about the Apollo program. And I think it was, uh, Apollo uh, 8, I don't know if you know this story, but Apollo 8 was the first one, and if I get the numbers wrong, I apologize, but Apollo 8 was the the mission where they were just going to go and orbit the Earth, but, you know, there was competition with the Russians, and they there was some view that the Russians were going to orbit the moon, and so they asked all of the, the team uh, that was on Apollo eight, they said, Hey, do you think you can do the moon? And they went back and looked, and this was like 18 months before they were going to launch. And they said, you know what? I think we can. And so they did all these first, you know, they were the first to exit the earth's orbit, the first to go around the moon. And then the, the, uh, amazing thing is that, you know, the pictures of the earth that you see out there, the famous pictures of the earth from the mm-hmm. moon, they didn't even expect that, you know, they were, they were sent up there to take pictures of the moon, to find a landing spot, everything. But so, you know, first, first lesson is, you know, uh, gosh, sometimes you discover stuff that you didn't expect. That's really important. (laughs) Like a picture of the earth and that perspective. The other thing that, that I think is core to our culture, which is just fascinating during this documentary, they, interviewed the the commander of the mission and uh you know there there's a famous speech i think it was on christmas eve when the astronauts they're orbiting the moon and they broadcast to the back to earth and i and it's you know to date it's the most people that listen to a single voice in history because this Mm. was across all countries and the 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 commander 
uh, you know, spoke of Genesis out of the Bible, right? And 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 so what was what was amazing <laughs> about that is when they're interviewing him, they're saying, "How did you come up with this?" And he said, "Well, you know, we talked to the executives that at NASA, and they said do what's appropriate." And you know, I about fell out of my chair because in this day and age, you know, it would take longer to figure out, get everybody's uh, approval on what to say than it would to build the damn rocket, right? Yeah. yeah. But but in those days, they trusted one another. They were focused on bringing those astronauts back alive more than what their perception yeah. was. And, you know, on the, the, the unimportance of this speech and what's, What's so fascinating is that it was probably one of the best things that they could come up with, you know, to 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 talk about from the moon. And so we have, you know, a culture and we 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 use it all the time. We say do what's appropriate. Right. Yeah. Be, yeah. Because it empowers the person that's making that decision. And, you know, it, it's okay to fail, uh, but also some brilliant things come out, like a brilliant picture of the moon or a brilliant speech to you know all the inhabitants of Earth. Um, that you know, it's in hindsight seems to be perfect. Uh, yeah. You know, regardless of your religion or spiritual uh, preference. So, you know, we have a culture of do what's appropriate. Yeah. I love it. I'm I'm so interested in this topic, and you know, uh, read a lot of books about it. But uh, hearing it from someone um, really is different. So thanks for for sharing that. Um, You're welcome. My my last question is before I, before I can let you go uh, start your day um, is about um, or the question is what's what's the last book you read or or blog post or or video that you saw or any piece of content for that matter that you would recommend um, future entrepreneurs um, to read or, or watch? Um, oh man, I'm reading so many books. Let's see. Um, uh, you know, uh, I would, you, you brought it up. There is an, uh, gosh, I don't have it at the tip of my, uh, head, but there is um, a great blog post and video on pricing and packaging. Uh, I, I think that you know that's super important. You brought it up. Uh, uh, I'll send it so maybe you can post it on the website. Uh, yeah. uh, that's important. I also think you know uh, every uh, startup entrepreneur needs to understand all of the SaaS 2.0 metrics. So, yeah. you know, CAC, LTV, you know, uh, uh, all of those things are critical. And I'm still amazed that, uh, that, that those fundamental pieces, those kind of building blocks aren't completely understood. So I think, you know, you need to be well-versed in that. And maybe that's, maybe that's too obvious, but I, I, I am a, a firm believer in the fundamentals. So I'd want everyone to, uh, to, to know that. Um, uh, I think those are pretty good, good starting points. Definitely. Um, you know, I'm also reading, uh, a book called the, uh, you know, 21 lessons of the 21st century, struggling with the author right now, uh, but you can find that. This is a great book, I think, on where we are uh, at a global level. It's, I don't believe everything in the book, but it gives a good perspective. I think it's important for entrepreneurs to have a, a broad global perspective, um, you know, with their, their startup. So anything that turns them on <clears throat> from that point of view, and I'm one of these big believers, I read 
you know, six or seven books at a time. That's why I usually can't quote what I'm actually, yeah. you know, <laughs> most, most excited about. But, but I think those are, that's important. Really make sure you understand the fundamental, the fundamentals, because, you know, um, when you do it, you, when you've done it as long as I have, it really is a craft. And so, you know, I think there's inspiration and, and, you know, innovation and, and all of these things that ha- that, that have some, some level of magic to them, or we don't completely understand, but those kinds of things that, you know, the higher brain function, you know, creative things can't happen if you don't understand the craft. And, and so you need to make sure you got the fundamentals down, uh, before you, you know, uh, blow yourself up. How's that? (laughs) That's a good ending. <laughs> Definitely. I remember my, my first yeah. start in, into entrepreneurship. I had no idea what CAC and LTV meant. Um, and looking back, I'm, I, I can totally agree with you. Uh, it's so important to, to know these. Yeah, you got to know the fundamentals. You got to know how to use the screwdriver and the hammer and the table saw, you know, uh, before you're going to build some beautiful piece of furniture. Exactly. That's a good metaphor. Russ, thank you so much for joining and, and sharing your thoughts and experience with, uh, with me. I'm, I'm super grateful and, and with our listeners as well. Well, I, I, uh, back at you, Daniel, I'm, I'm grateful for your time and uh, humbled to be on your podcast. All Thanks. Right. All the best uh, for Zen business. Great. Thank you. That was it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Startup Stories. Make sure to check out the show notes with additional links at nerdentrepreneurs.com. And if you like our podcast, leave a review on iTunes. See you on Monday.